I'm James Isbister. I'm a, a, a clinical haematologist and I've had a career interest in the benefits and the risks of blood transfusion and more recently in the, the area of what we call patient blood management. Now I've become aware over the years that although transfusion frequently can be really life-saving, in other circumstances we don't have really good evidence for efficacy of these transfusions and we're questioning that we may be exposing patients more to a, a risk with little evidence for actual benefit. Now we're very fortunate that um, uh, Louise here has um, agreed to come along and tell her story um, about an operation she had to go through and quite considerable uh, therapy. And it's an interesting story because Louise does come from a background of having some knowledge in the medical area and transfusion area. Louise's story is a really lovely story and in part because a lot of things went really well for her um, and, and she's obviously had um, a good outcome. That's a great story and it's really what should happen to everyone, isn't it? My story began in 2009 where I went to give my usual blood donation. I'd been a blood donor for many years. And at the pre-donation testing, they discovered that my haemoglobin was low. So they took a blood sample um, and told me to follow up with my GP. So a couple of weeks later, uh, the results came back and they showed my ferritin was uh, at six. But my GP, uh, bless him, uh, decided that he didn't think something was wrong. He thought something was wrong. So uh, he sent me off for a colonoscopy. But at endoscopy and the biopsy later showed that I had a, a stage 3B rectal cancer. So it's quite a serious, quite an advanced uh, stage of cancer. Yeah, right. So uh, the next thing was to head off to, to meet a surgeon. Um, and it wasn't quite clear in the early stages whether I would go straight off to surgery or have some chemotherapy, radiation mm. therapy first. Mm. Um, but I knew what I wanted to happen first, and that was uh, to have an iron infusion. Mm. And the reason I wanted that was I'd been working in um, transfusion medicine research mm. for a number of years. And I was aware of the literature which has um, been uh, published in the recent years, which suggests that for those people who have transfusions, blood transfusions, their outcomes are poorer than those who don't mm. in similar circumstances. So I reasoned that the best thing for me would be to increase my haemoglobin level. Mm. And the quickest and most um, safe way to do that is um, an iron, intravenous iron infusion. So I asked the um, the surgeon, I said, I'd, I'd like to have an, an intravenous iron infusion. And, and they arranged for me to have an iron infusion the next day. So within a week of seeing my GP, I'd had an endoscopy, I'd had a variety of, of um, diagnostic images and blood tests, I'd, and I'd had an iron infusion. Interestingly enough, uh, two weeks later, I met the oncologist. I felt better than I had for years. Yeah. And the irony of that wasn't lost on me, that I would be diagnosed and despite the anxiety and all of that um, around my situation, I felt fantastic. Mm. I got vitality and energy I hadn't had in years. And I think in retrospect, that feeling of wellness really helped me face what came after, mm. not just physically, but emotionally, mentally. I actually felt like I could deal with this situation. I could beat the cancer because I felt I felt well for the first time. At that time at surgery, my haemoglobin had risen um, as it had after the iron infusion up to 125, which mm. is a pretty normal level. Yeah. Following surgery, um, it dropped down again to 107 just after surgery. But within eight days postoperatively, it had dropped right down to 83. Um, which is uh, quite low. But in consultation with the ward physician again, they were quite happy to um, let things ride. I had another iron infusion at that stage, um, but within a couple of weeks, my haemoglobin was back up to normal again, uh, and I was able to avoid having a blood transfusion. But I was also fortunate in that I, I met with medical professionals who were willing to engage in the conversation who didn't dismiss me out of hand as some crackpot who um, you know, 
was demanding way out therapies. Uh, you, you obviously handled it very well all the way through. And, but then on the other hand, I think, as you say, you were fortunate with the medical profession. And I think that obviously your GP had a feeling. I mean, it would be easy for your GP to have said, oh, look, you know, common anemia, people are fatigued. Yeah. You're not actually severely anemic and, you know, do nothing. Or to go uh, away, take a few but, iron pills. But clearly you know. <laughs> had, a, had a feeling that things weren't yeah. quite right. Yeah. And then you see a surgeon that you could discuss with and was very open to mm. a, a proper dialogue between you. Mm. And then that sort of went right through the rest mm. of the system. So you really didn't come into um, significant conflict in the sense that you had to push hard for anything. It, no, it all no, sort of all. worked through. It's, it's really yeah. good. Lil, I'm, I'd particularly like your view on the general practitioner's role in the management of elective surgery in general? Well, I think particularly when you're looking at elective surgery and a long-term relationship with the GP, they'll often have on record the full blood counts of recent times. And once you shift your gaze to thinking about preparation for the elective surgery, um, then clearly a focus on that haemoglobin and a focus on the iron studies is really important. I think that that role for GPs is really fundamental. I think by the time they get to their um, pre-anaesthetic uh, and pre-admission consultations, you've lost some really valuable time. Inevitably, particularly for elective surgery, particularly for joint replacement surgery, um, there will be some period of time in which you can be starting to address um, hemo low haemoglobins. Um, and given that time, you should make the best use of it you can. In the post-operative setting, it's going to be very much the tolerance of anemia. And I just, uh, what I would be interested in in the post-operative setting is how do you dialogue with a patient? Well, I think that, you know, medicine is all about the balance, isn't it? Mm. It's about the balance of risk and about the balance of um, risk and benefit, essentially. And really, that's the conversation you need to be having with patients. I, I think broadly in the community, there is a sense that a transfusion is always good. And I think that, in fact, we need to be talking to patients mm. about why you might not consider a transfusion and what actually are your options. And and that, you know, while you're in this post-operative phase, we have a bit of time that we could actually um, amend your iron status um, and thereby amend your haemoglobin without having to resort to a transfusion and without regretting the fact that intraoperatively you had, didn't have a transfusion. Mm -hmm. That's actually a cause for celebration, mm -hmm. not for regret. particularly in Australia, but in fact around the world. Anaesthetists are now much more involved early on in the preparation of patients. And this is providing a platform for us to intervene uh, with interventions such as Louise had. Uh, and I don't think we're doing it enough. And I think this is an example of what we should be doing more. We're routinely uh, having contact with the patient some days before surgery. Uh, and there are lots of advantages to that. It gives us a chance to see the patient early, do the tests that may identify if they're anemic or even if they're not anemic, if they've got an iron deficiency, uh, and then put in place giving them iron, which is the one where that's where most of the action is, I suppose. Uh, and we've had some pretty interesting experiences similar to Louise uh, with patients who even two days after an iron infusion, come in smiling and saying, wow, this is the best I've felt for a long time.